Um, Holy Wednesday marks two important moments, Judas's betrayal and the anointing at Bethany. On Holy Wednesday, Jesus remains in Bethany um, at his friend's um, house where, where Lazarus, Martha, and Mary are. And the, remember the actions of the previous three days, his entrance into Jerusalem, the cleansing of the temple, and teaching the temple have really set Jesus at odds with the authorities. Um, he is not on the side of the authorities, whether we're talking, essentially we're talking about the Jewish authorities. All right, and clearly um, the Jewish authorities in the persons of, uh, of Annas and Caiaphas, the two high priests, are really most likely going to be thinking about by this point, how can they uh, get rid of Jesus? Um, and the question really ultimately is, is Jesus' is crucifixion an execution or a judicial murder? We'll have some more to say about that later. Here's the uh, image again of where Jesus has been. Bethany um, is a couple of miles east of Jerusalem. So Jesus can easily make the trek there in the morning of any of these days that we have been following. Again, here's the view of Bethany, a modern view of Bethany. Um, here is a view of Lazarus's tomb. Um, and, and, uh, and then here is, that's just to kind of review where we've been. Here we see um, a marvelous um, uh, picture um, by Giotto um, of Judas's betrayal. Um, and you can see Judas uh, has a money bag in his hand. He's talking to the high priests um, and there's a demon uh, right behind him, right? And Luke 22, chapter, chapter 22, verse three says um, specifically, and then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the 12. So uh, a, a marvelous depiction. Of, of what is about to take place. Quoting from, reading from Matthew 26, then one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Who is Judas Iscariot? Judas Iscariot um, is certainly, we know, one of the 12 apostles, He's always listed in the Gospels where when the Gospel writers list the 12 apostles, the name of the 12 apostles, he always comes at the end. Interestingly, Judas never refers to Jesus as Lord, um, but he always calls him teacher or rabbi. And something perhaps to think about. And these details may indicate um, that Judas was not one of the closest associates of Jesus as perhaps Peter James and John were. Judas's betrayal is hinted at in several places um, in the Old Testament. Here are a couple of psalm verses that we don't have time to go into, um, but talk about betrayal, about friendship, and about the Lord. And they're usually taken, these two psalm verses, in, four, in Psalm 41 and Psalm 55, as referring as sort of prophetic references to ultimately Jesus's uh, betrayal by Judas. Judas's nickname, if you will, is Iscariot, um, but it's probably not a nickname. It probably refers to the man from Karioth. Ish in Hebrew and in Aramaic both mean man. And then the word right, at or right after that, Karioth or Kariotha, um, Karioth was actually a city um, located in the southern part of Judea. Kariotha in Aramaic means city itself. So he could have been, it could be the man from the city. It could mean that Judas, the man from the city, i.e. Jerusalem, or it could mean the man from Karioth. Um, most likely people take it to mean the man from Karioth. Karioth has been identified with a small village, as I said, in the Southern part of Judea. All right. Um, and it's interesting to note that all of Jesus, Jesus's disciples came from Galilee, except probably Judas, as far as we can tell, as far as we can tell, because we don't have all the, um, the name places for the disciples. In addition to Judas, um, we have the two high priests, and these are the two high priests that Judas, the chief priests that are mentioned in the, in the Gospels that Judas is going to um, uh, enter into con contact with. Um, and uh, it's interesting that the evangelists call Judas Iscariot, um, excuse me, um, say that Judas Iscariot met with high priests in the plural. Well, who were these high priests? According to Jewish law, the high priests were selected from the tribe of Levi, um, that is Aaron's line. 
um, and then later on from the Sadducees. However, um, with the coming of the Roman and Roman authority in 6 AD, when Judea is, is placed directly under Roman control, the Roman authorities, that is the prefects, i.e. Pontius Pilate and those who preceded him and those who will follow him, interfered in the appointment of the high priest, often deposing high priests. We have mentioned this um, earlier last time. Um, so in fact, Annas, who was high priest from the year 6 AD to 15 AD, was deposed. He didn't die. Usually um, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, the high priest was appointed for life. But during the Roman period, the Romans replaced the high priest because they were really looking for a collaborator. They wanted a high priest who was going to do the, 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 the workings of the Roman authorities. And it seems that Annas is pushed to the side in 15 AD, and his son-in-law, Caiaphas, is appointed. And Caiaphas will um, be high priest in 18 AD, and he will be deposed in 36 AD, which means he was he was high priest for 18 years. But while he's high priest, while Jesus is in Jerusalem in 30 AD, Annas is also considered a high priest because he's still alive and still has that honorific title. So when the gospel writers speak about the chief priests or the high priests, they're really referring to both Annas and Caiaphas. And here's an interesting 19th century depiction of the two um, father and son-in-law high priests. We have to think in terms also that Caiaphas, and certainly Annas as well, but Caiaphas in particular, um, who will be high priest for 16 to 18 years, must have been very good at doing, um, of maintaining a positive relationship with the Roman authorities. And there's no doubt that during this final week of Jesus's time in Jerusalem, that Caiaphas is watching and Annas are watching very closely Jesus's activities. They certainly are aware of his activities in the temple. Jesus has come to the temple three times in very public settings, Sunday morning, Monday morning to cleanse the temple. That certainly had to go get back to Caiaphas and Annas, and then his teaching pretty much for a long time in the, in the morning hours, maybe even into the early afternoon hours on Tuesday. So there's no doubt that Caiaphas um, is observing Jesus and certainly is trying to think about, well, I don't want any problems. I'm worried about the Roman authorities. I don't know who what this Jesus guy um, has in mind, what he's planning to do. If perhaps he's going to disrupt things during Passover, um, I don't know. And so it's very possible that Caiaphas is, is contemplating and thinking of ways of getting rid of Jesus. Remember that Caiaphas and Pilate had something in common. Pilate being the Roman, Roman procurator or prefect and Caiaphas being the high priest. That is, they are both interested in maintaining, maintaining the status quo because it benefited both of them. And they didn't want any disruptions. They didn't want any Jewish up, upheavals. Um, and neither did Caiaphas want the Romans to have any pretext, any reason to come in and disrupt um, Passover um, and to make things um, even worse than it might be right now for the Jewish peoples. So how did Jesus, Judas meet the high priests and where did they meet them? Now, does Judas go and find the high priest? Did the high priests come and look for Judas? Um, it's not specifically that clear, um, but um, what we do know is that most likely, most likely we should say, is that Judas probably greeted Caiaphas um, um, at his home, probably the same place where Jesus will be tried early Friday morning um, outside the home of Caiaphas when the Sanhedrin or part of the Sanhedrin will meet um, to just determine Jesus's fate and then hand him over to the Roman, to the Roman authorities. What you see on the screen here is an image of the Armenian monastery known as the Monastery of the Holy Savior. This is in the area of Mount Zion in Jerusalem today in the southwestern corner of Jerusalem, of the old city of Jerusalem. Um, and today this monastery is believed to be over probably the house of Caiaphas. At least that's what archeologists and historians um, who, 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 who work in this area have suggested. And here's an aerial view, and you can see here where my cursor is circling around Mount Zion. 
Um, this is the area where, where was actually it was a Jewish area in first century AD. Well, Israel, Jer Jerusalem is a Jewish area, but what I meant to say is that it is a wealthy Jewish area. Israelite elites um, live in this in this area here, um, and um, this is most likely where the House of Caiaphas was located. Um, these are first century AD remains of this area in Mount Zion that we've been speaking about. And they do depict um, homes and archeologists have discovered in these homes, here as you can see on your screen, a bath, an indoor bath, which suggests that this is a wealthy area. Uh, bath, an indoor bath complexes um, in someone's home is not something that ordinary people would have in their homes. Um, but certainly this home does in this area on Mount Zion, which suggests that this is a wealthy area, most likely the area of the Jerusalem um, elites, uh, Jewish elites are living. Here's a reconstruction of one of these homes in the area of Mount Zion around in the first century AD. And this is something perhaps of what Caiaphas's house might have looked like. It's re relatively opulent. The Armenian monastery, as we said, is now located um, is now located over what people believe would have been the area where Caiaphas's house is. If you go to Jerusalem today, you will actually yeah, go to now. the Armenian. Ah, Father Eugene, I think he we just see him. Very good. So you see the Armenian monastery where it's located today. Um, the Armenian monastery is located um, outside of if you go to Jerusalem today, outside of what is known as the old city walls. But that's not to confuse you, because when you go outside those walls, you're actually still inside the city during the time of Jesus. The walls that you walk through now to go to the Armenian monastery are walls that were built in 70 AD after, um, after the destruction, um, where they were built actually after um, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. All right, so, so that area was part of Jerusalem, even though today, if you go there, you'll, you know, it'll be outside the, the old walls of Jerusalem. This ossuary is a remarkable piece um, uh, that survives from the first century. An ossuary, um, don't be dis deceived here, that this is not a casket. This is not a large, um, a large casket size. An ossuary is a smaller box where the bones of a deceased after the flesh had been uh, had been uh, had been taken off, the flesh had rotted away. The bones are collected and placed in 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 boxes called ossuaries. And this first century ossuary has been uh, unearthed in Jerusalem, and it has the inscription Joseph Caiaphas. It's possible um, uh, that um, this actually was the ossuary that had the bones of 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 of. Um, of Caiaphas. In fact, when they discovered this ossuary, there were bones of an elderly man about 60 years old. So it's very possible that this is actually the ossuary of Caiaphas and those were his bones. So these Wednesdays, the day actually when we commemorate the betrayal done by Judas. And we know that the amount of money that Judas received or 30 pieces of silver were in Hebrew shekels, mentioned only in Matthew chapter 26, 15, and appears in Old Testament text, this kind of price. In Exodus chapter 21, 32, the price of a slave who was killed. In Zechariah 11, 12, 14, the engraved honorarium paid to a shepherd. Hosea chapter 3, 2 speaks, but in a very convoluted way about a price of redemption. Hosea was one of the prophets of Israel, of ancient Israel. He lived around 740, 725. This is the time when he exercised his function as a prophet of Israel. And God asked Hosea to marry a prostitute. Uh, as a symbolic prophetic act. He married this prostitute, then he had three kids, then the prostitute leaves him alone, and God asked Prophet Hosea to go and to redeem his wife, because his wife probably became a slave 
to a Canaanite uh, worship place. And the price of redemption that was I had to pay was 15 shekels and some quantity of barley, which brought us again to the total price of redemption, 30 shekels in value. So this kind of prophecy or this kind of action, if you like, Hosea uh, foreshadows the price that the high priest offered to Judas, one of the 12, to betray, or rather the word betray sounds a little bit too harsh. Uh, paradidomi in Greek means to hand over because uh, Judas was offering himself to the high priest to uh, hand over Jesus to them uh, and for these 30 pieces of silver. And this is the Tyrannian uh, shekel used to pay the annual tax to the temple or treasury. We spoke about this yesterday, the coin minted near Jerusalem between 16 BC and 69. This kind of coin could have been probably in the hands of Judas. Had on one face the image of a pagan deity, Melchar Heracles, and one verse of an angel eagle symbol of Roman power. Did Judas betray Jesus for money? This is a great question. Why or what was the rational that Judas, one of the closest, uh, I would say, uh, disciples of Christ because he was a kind of treasurer for the little group of disciples. It is impossible now to go back in time and discover the real intentions of Judas Iscariot, but at least we can calculate the price of betrayal, 30 pieces of silver or shekels. If 30 shekels were the equivalent of a Roman denarius, denarius was another currency or coin, and a Roman soldier was paid about 225 denarii per year in those days, then the price of betrayal was an eighth of a soldier's wages. In comparison, a modern day US military soldier earns about 25 grand a year. So Judas received the equivalent of 3,000 in today's value. Moreover, if one considers the price of a slave, 30 shekels, Exodus 21, 32, and then we have CNN's Freedom Project, which estimated that in 2009, the average price of a slave was 90 bucks, then Judas could have been paid anywhere between $90 and $3,000 in today's value. The time of betrayal, according to Mark and Matthew, Judas possibly went to the high priest to give this offer, to deliver Jesus into their hands after the dinner in Bethany, sometimes during the Holy Wednesday, probably at evening time. According to John, to the Gospel of John, is Judas leaving the upper room on Holy Thursday evening to meet with the high priests and elders. And Luke, among the four Gospel writers, is just quiet on the specific time. So how can we reconcile the notice that we have from Mark and Matthew, which looks like Judas went to the high priest Holy Wednesday at evening time, and John, who tells us that Judas went to meet with the high priest on Holy Thursday evening. Notably, we have to notice this, the adverb then in Greek tote in Matthew 26, 14, in conjunction and K in Mark 14, 10, might indicate a logical rather than a chronological sequence. So according to Matthew, Mark was like Judas and the rest of the apostles were angry on the fact that that woman came and spent so much money on a little alabaster, a little jar, a very costly nard or myrrh, around probably $30,000, and spent this kind of money just to anoint Jesus instead of giving this amount of money to the poor. So because of this, says Matthew and Mark, if we use this then, tote, 
and k, then Judas took that this decision to go and to betray uh, Jesus to the religious authorities. So probably this should be the meaning, not a chronological that Judas immediately left the room of the banquet on Wednesday evening and went to uh, sell, if you like, Jesus. But rather, like John tells us, that happened probably uh, Thursday evening. Moreover, if the dinner took place in Bethany, then it's quite difficult to imagine Judas now leaving Simon the leper's house, the host of night, five miles away from Jerusalem and heading for Jerusalem to meet Caiaphas and the elders at the high priest's house on Mount Zion. The reason now for Judas' betrayal, this is more difficult than anything. What determined Judas to betray his master? 30 pieces of silver were a poor compensation for such dire consequences, Jesus' crucifixion and then Judas' suicide. If the reason for Judas' betrayal remains still a great mystery, the canonical gospels and ancient Christian interpreters, like the hymnographers, do offer their own explanations. Matthew and Mark, we don't have any clear reason. Perhaps Judah, along with other disciples, were scandalized by the fact that Jesus allows such a costly perfume to be poured on him on Wednesday. Luke, Judas was possessed by Satan. Luke is that had that kind of um, understanding that Satan was after Christ. First, Satan tempted Christ. We see this in Luke chapter 4. And we learned that Jesus passed this test successfully. So he didn't climb one inch towards Satan. So Satan, says Luke, left the Lord for a later time. And then we learn again, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, that Satan entered into the heart of Judas and made Judas to betray Jesus. So this is the explanation of Luke, that uh, the betrayal of Judas was the work of Satan. John, what John says about the reason or the rationale of this betrayal? According to John, Judas was a thief. And out of love for money, Argifelia, he betrayed Jesus, John chapter 12, 4, 6. The Byzantine hymnodists and the ancient Christian interpreters of the large follow closely John's interpretive hint, emphasizing Judas' avarice. But the mystery of Judas' betrayal has never been solved satisfactorily. Because like I said, if you have a friend and you sell that friend for $3,000 today. I mean, I, can, I cannot understand that somebody will betray a friend for $3,000. The anointing of Bethany. So what happened to Bethany? Here we have a very interesting illumination, manuscript illumination, the Cistercian manuscript, Basil 1260 where we see two types of anointing. You see a woman here pouring the myrrh, the perfume on the head of Jesus. And here another woman actually pouring the perfume on the <clears throat> sinless feet and clean feet of Jesus. So what we have in this illumination is a conflation, if you like, a combination of two episodes in the life of Jesus, having two distinct women and two different ways of doing this anointing. There are three different anointing episodes during Jesus' mission. First was the anointing of the house of Simon the Pharisee by a woman See, called sinner in the city, which occurred perhaps in the beginning of Jesus' mission in Capernaum, a little fisher um, uh, town uh, close to the Lake of Galilee. And this is mentioned in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50, and the anointing happened on the feet of Jesus. The second anointing episode happened at Bethany, perhaps in the house of Lazarus, Saturday, the holy, the Saturday of Lazarus, after Lazarus' resurrection, probably by Mary, 
one of the two sisters of Lazarus, like we learn in John chapter 12, 1 to 8, and the anointing of Jesus' feet as a sign of burial. Then the third anointing episode happened in the last week of Jesus' life, in the Holy Week, during the Holy Week, on Wednesday, and it happened in the house of Simon the Letter. This man was probably healed by Jesus, that's why he's mentioned Simon the Letter, and he was residing in Bethany, again, the village of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, and he had a house, of course, and Jesus, you know, was invited by him, Simon the Letter, probably a Pharisee, to have a dinner. And the anointing happened in this house, and the anointing was on his head as a sign of burial. So if you ask me historically what we celebrate, what we commemorate on the Holy Wednesday is this third anointing episode in the house of Simon the leper in Bethany, where a woman is not mentioned by name, approach Jesus, and anointing him on his head, and Jesus considered this a sign of burial. On Holy Wednesday, we celebrate the anointing of Jesus' head by a woman in the house of Simon the leper in Bethany, and this is mentioned in Matthew, actually the gospel that we read for Holy Wednesday, Matthew 26, 6, 13. Now, look at what the gospel says. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with the alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she put it on his head as he sat at table. But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. Our misconception is to to throw all the blame on the shoulders of Judas for these words. But you see that here, the assembly, the gathering of the disciples, all together, they were indignant, they were angry on Jesus that he accepted such anointment. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In putting this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And it's true. You know, it happens, at least in the Orthodox uh, celebrations, we always read uh, this passage of Matthew 26, 6, 13, about what happened in the house of Simon the leper. As you can notice, the Gospel reading, Matthew 26, follows closely the chronological unfolding of the events related to Jesus last week in Jerusalem. A few days before his crucifixion, Jesus was anointed by an named woman who put the oil on his head, and this happened in the house of Simon the leper. Now, when you go to churches, you know, the Orthodox Church, Tuesday evening, by anticipation, celebrating what happens in the Holy Wednesday, this is the phenomenal, the most famous, probably, among all of the Byzantine hymns. And if you like a good, thoughtful, detailed explanation, you find it in my one of my latest books that uh, already published, um, Hearing the Scriptures, Cassias or Cassias hymn, which was composed in ninth century by a pious Byzantine nun by name Cassia, and was inspired by another anointing done by a sinful woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee in Capernaum, Galilee. So you see, the, the hymn doesn't speak about the, uh, what chronologically happened on that Holy Wednesday. It speaks about another anointing episode, which happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the house of Simon the Pharisee in Capernaum, Galilee, in the north of the country. Moreover, Holy Wednesday hymn makes Judas 
the spokesperson of the indignant disciples in Matthew 26, 8, placing him in a sharp contrast with the sinful woman. So you see the hypnotist, Cassia, makes a nice, sharp contrast between this sinful woman who came and covered down the Simon, the Pharisee house and anointing Jesus and Judas. A woman was uh, celebrated for her bravery to come forward, to be courageous, and Judas was actually uh, remembered for being uh, shy, timid, uh, mischievous, hiding himself. This shows the creativity of the hypnotist who conflated various gospel readings and anointing episodes in a complex picture with a dramatic touch. Now we learn from the Gospels that Jesus was declining at the banquet you know, on Wednesday evening, katakimenu at the table. This was the Hellenistic Romans. So do not imagine Jesus like sitting on chairs, but rather reclining on his left arm and using the right hand to pick the food or the cup of wine. This was the Hellenistic Roman way to sit at the table reclining, leaning on the left side while eating with the right side. So here we have interesting uh, 8th century mosaic, Last Supper, Santa Apollinaire Nuovo Ravenna, and Jesus the, and the 11 apostles reclining at the table. You see, they are not sitting on chairs, but rather reclining, like I said, on their uh, left arm. Here is a modern representation uh, of the Last Supper. So you see, this is Jesus, and this would be John, this Peter. And Jesus and perhaps John were at the head of the table, were reclining on mattresses or sofas. Here is another reproduction of the triclinum, a Roman way, which was uh, now spreading even in Palestine, Roman way, a communal eating. You see three tables, uh, three rounds of mattresses. So we learned from the gospel that that woman brought an alabaster jar, a very costly, pure nard. Alabaster is a fine-grained, translucent, translucent type of gypsum carved with ornaments. Like you see this, an ancient Cypriot alabaster flask. The neck was broken to let the perfume ointment pour out. So this is the neck. So if you like to use it, you, you just break this neck and then you pour out the perfume. According to the historian Pliny the Elder, the best perfumes were kept in alabaster flask like this type of jars. In some households, an alabaster of very costly perfume, like the one mentioned in Mark, was a treasure trove handed over from generation to generation unto the female members of that family. Very costly, pure nard we learned that that woman used. So it's not just a commonplace perfume like we use today to uh, offer to our um, spouses and so forth, 100, 200 bucks. This was very, very costly. The nard was an amber colored ointment extracted from an aromatic Himalayan plant believed to be the spike nard. Very costly, oh, approximately 300 denarii. And we know that 220 denarii was the yearly income of a Roman soldier in those days. So the equivalent of $25,000. And now, if you approximately, probably the cost of such an alabaster flask with that very costly perfume was in today's value $30,000. So that woman had probably this alabaster probably for a number of generations and was kept probably in the most sacred place in that household. And that was the whole treasure that she had. And she offered this to our Lord. Then we get Bethany and other illumination uh, reclining at the table. The meaning of the anointing of Bethany. Anointings were common at the time of Passover. We read this in Psalm 23, 5. Look at the Psalm 
three fine sense. You, God, you prepare a table before me. So this is the worshiper coming to the temple in Jerusalem and reciting this psalm during the Passover uh, feast days. You prepare a table before me opposite to those who afflict me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So this is the image. If you like, if you ask, if you go back in time, my good friends, to an ancient believer in Jerusalem and you ask, can you give me the definition of happiness? He will tell you, if I have somebody to anoint my head in my household, the servant or whatever, whoever, and then he anoints my head with oil, and then I have another servant to wash my feet, and then I have a cup overflowing with wine, I'll be the happiest person on earth. What a big difference between our standards and the ancient Jewish standards in those days. How prophetic was the psalmist or the psalmist words when we think of the anointing of Bethany and what followed. Jesus was probably happy like any Jewish believer when he was invited by Simon, Simon the leper and Bethany for that banquet. And then the woman came and anointed his head and then he had in front of him a cup of wine. The anointing foretells and prepares Jesus' burial. She, Jesus says, she anointed my body beforehand for its burial. According to Mark 15, 46, Joseph of Arimathea bought a linen shroud and wrapped Jesus' body without anointing. We know that Jesus was taken from the cross, was late, was uh, Friday, uh, uh, four o'clock probably, close to the sunset. At the sunset, a new day starts. That was the Sabbath day and one of the greatest Sabbath days because it was also uh, the first day, a Passover festival. So nobody was actually allowed to perform any work. So Joseph of Arimathea brought some linen shroud and wrapped Jesus' body being taken from the cross without any anointing, because that was the ritual to anoint the body. First of all, to wash the body, to anointing, then wrapping up on linen shroud and putting in the tomb. Uh, so it was the custom. So Jesus' prophetic word was fulfilled because Jesus didn't have that ritual. Uh, people didn't have time to do it. So uh, that's why Jesus said, this woman anointed my body beforehand for its burial, because Jesus knew that he, the people would not have time to wash his body full of spots and blood and mud or to anointing his body. We see the murder-bearing women, those pious female disciples from Galilee, mentioned in Luke chapter 8, coming to the tomb very early on the Sunday of resurrection with little containers of myrrh and perfumes to anoint Jesus' life for his body. But they discovered that the tomb was empty and Jesus arose from the dead. But what the woman did in the house of Simon the leper, that was a foreshadowing, and if you like, uh, an action, action beforehand. She did what the ritual suggested to be done on a lifeless body that body to be anointing. But like I said, Jesus didn't have that ritual completed on him. Based now the spiritual meaning of the Holy Wednesday, based on the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, the Byzantine liturgists who crafted a plethora of beautiful hymns for this day, strike a sharp contrast between Judas hiding himself and the woman of Bethany, identified by the hymnodist with the sinful woman in Luke chapter 7, note Cassia, him, who came forward determined to show her genuine repentance and selfless love to the lover of mankind. Christ now is Simon the Pharisee, Peter Paul Rubens 1620.
the woman anointing Jesus head and the woman washing Jesus feet you've seen this illumination we have two episodes conflated and the same beautiful representation and this is the role of any liturgical genre if you like even we, we talk about hymns or icons the simultaneity of the events this is something unique to the byzantine liturgical way of expressing uh, episodes narrated in the gospels because here in this lima representation we have two episodes being uh, uh, recorded in the anointing in Capernaum, uh, Simon the Pharisee, and the anointing which happened actually on Holy Wednesday in Bethany, uh, Simon the leper, when Jesus' head was anointed and this Jesus' feet were anointed in the Capernaum. So I'm leaving you here with Jim actually to go to the Last Supper and then coming back. Jim? You are mute. Thank you, Father Eugene. Very good. All right, so um, that's Holy Wednesday. We're going to shift now to Holy Thursday um, and the events that will lead up to the Last Supper. Um, and I'm quickly going to take us through just sort of the geographical location um, of the Last Supper. And then we'll talk a little bit more at the end of the webinar about some of the theological meanings um, that are going to take place. Um, this um, 15th century uh, icon, Byzantine icon, is quite uh, powerful in the sense that if you start out with the left-hand corner, you see the four main events um, of, of Holy Thursday. Um, you see the Last Supper in the top left-hand corner. If you go over to the right, you see the washing of the feet, the disciples' feet, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and then go down to the lower um, left-hand column, um, left hand corner, excuse me. Um, and here you see uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus's prayer. And then um, you also see here in the bottom right hand column, um, Jesus's arrest. I'm going to focus just on the top part here that is and talk about the location in Jerusalem where the Last Supper takes place. On Holy Wednesday, um, there in the morning, there is an attempt to go ahead and Jesus is telling his disciples, Peter and John in particular, um, to go and prepare um, for the coming feast for Passover. And so Peter and John uh, leave Bethany um, and they go into Jerusalem to prepare for a Passover meal for Friday evening. The Thursday evening meal um, that we're going to be talking about um, is a meal with Jesus' disciples, and that was a regular dinner, as the Gospel of John tells us. So it wasn't, uh, in the Orthodox tradition, the Last Supper is seen um, based on the chronology in the Gospel of John, which it was not a Passover meal. It was a meal, a final regular eat meal that Jesus had with his disciples. Again, here is the image that we've seen several times. Um, so in Luke 22, um, we read Jesus sends Peter, sent Peter and John, telling them, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. And then they ask him, well, where should we prepare for it? And he says, well, when you enter into the city, you'll see a man carrying a jar of water. And follow him into the house. And, and into the house, you will say to the owner of the house, quote, teacher, the teacher asks me, where is the guest room where I meet the Passover with my disciples? and he will show you a large room upstairs already furnished, and there you will make preparations. So Peter and John, two of Jesus's most trustworthy disciples, are sent to locate the place where they're going to have their Passover meal. And essentially the preparations would have been basically to prepare the Paschal lamb and to prepare other kinds of um, necessary items for the meal. It's interesting that they are told to find a man carrying a jar of water. Usually in the ancient world, it was the woman's job um, to go ahead um, and, and prepare and, and get water from wells and whatnot. But also it's interesting that it's kind of cryptic here um, to basically not make public where Jesus's meal is going to take place. Perhaps, perhaps to keep Judas um, and those who are now seeking Jesus that is the high priest and those around him 
at bay so at least they cannot know where Jesus is going to have his his uh, meal for Passover. Uh, the meeting place um, is usually um, believed by scholars today to be the gate of the Essenes, um, which is again in the southwest uh, corner of Jerusalem. Um, and it would have been located in this area right here. This, this line right here is the current wall for the um, old city of Jerusalem. But at the time of Jesus, the wall was actually down here. And this is the area where Caiaphas's house that we looked at before um, would have, uh, was located most likely. And this is also uh, most likely where the upper room um, would have been located um, as well. So much of the activity on Thursday um, is going to take place in this area, the arrest, um, and then the trial of Jesus in front of Pilate, and then the burial of Jesus up here. Um, whereas the first few days of Holy Week, the action was in the temple. The last few days of Holy Week, the action will be in the southwest corner and in the northwest quadrant outside the city walls where Jesus will be crucified um, and buried. Here is what archaeologists have discovered as a Roman road um, that led into the gate of the Essenes, most likely um, this is a reconstruction of what that gate might have looked like, most likely um, where the Peter and, and John uh, met uh, uh, the, uh, the man holding the jug of water. And again, here is another depiction um, of that area. And this is the area of the House of Caiaphas, the area of the upper room where the meal uh, would have taken place. Um, and then this is the Herod's palace where, um, where Pilate will be staying during, during this week of preparation towards Passover. And this is where Jesus will be tried in front of Pilate um, and scourged um, as well. The upper room. We're told in scripture that he will show you a large room upstairs. He, that is the owner of the house, will show Peter and John a guest chamber, a katalima, located upstairs. A Greek word is anagion, uh, which means basically an upper room. Um, this upper room is described as large, um, and it's furnished, estromenon, it's furnished. So it's, it's actually, in other words, what's furnished probably means is that it's got mattresses or it's got benches um, for a large number of people to come and have a meal, perhaps in the upwards to 120 people, at least according to Acts 115, where they gather in the place of the Last Supper, we're told that there were that many people up there. Again, here's a reconstruction of perhaps what the, um, the, uh, the Last Supper might have looked like. Um, it's interesting that the owner of the house is a man, and the other man that they met carrying the water as well, um, the other person they met was a man. And it has been suggested that these two gentlemen were Essenes, and that the house in which Jesus is now going to have his final meal in um, was a house owned by an Essene. Essene was a group of Jewish faithful who had rejected the temple worship because of the corruption, because of the association of the temple leadership that had taken place with the Roman political authority. And they had set up their own um, sort of parallel uh, Jewish worship center. Um, and the Essenes um, are a group that we learn about also, um, not in the New Testament per se, but specifically, and um, we learned quite a bit by the Roman, uh, the Jewish historian, uh, Josephus. Just to re recall and to remind ourselves that the upper room um, has a fascinating history, not simply because it's the place where Jesus holds um, his final meal with the disciples, the Last Supper, um, but it is also where the apostles will be gathered after Jesus's death, that is the, the seventh uh, day after Jesus's death, that is we, we commemorate as the Sunday of Thomas, um, where Jesus will appear to, to the apostles um, in a post-resurrection appearance. It's also the same location where the apostles are gathered at Pentecost, when Jesus will send 50 days after his um, uh, resurrection, he will send uh, the disciples, um, uh, the Holy Spirit will descend upon, descend upon um, the disciples. There's possibility um, that a early church um, was identified, perhaps even a synagogue um, built um, there for the early Christian community. Remember the early Christian community, um, the earliest followers of Jesus are Jews. They, they continue to be Jews. And it's very possible that a, a location of worship was built um, at the place 
where the Last Supper was held. We do have a reference to a Church of the Apostles um, that a pilgrim mentions from Bordeaux um, who had visited Jerusalem in 333 AD. Um, and it's very possible this this was a Christian place of worship, i.e. perhaps synagogue, but Christian synagogue, that is a house of worship. It's very possible also that the Apostolic Council was held in the same room, Apostolic Council that we read about in the book of Acts chapter 15, um, where the apostles meet with Paul um, and they talk about whether or not um, proselytes, converts, Greek converts to Christianity ought to be circumcised. What we do know also in the second half of the fourth century in this area as well was built um, a very well-known church called the Church of Zion or Aia Sion, um, and it was considered to be a very important church in, in Jerusalem, and it was built um, in the second half of the fourth century. What you see now is where you will be taken today as, as identified as the upper room in Jerusalem. This is a 12th century, uh, 14th century um, building. Um, and, um, and this is what, uh, where it's traditionally identified as the upper room. This, isn't, this certainly isn't what the upper room exactly looked like, um, but it perhaps is on the site um, where, the, uh, where the Last Supper was held. Um, the upper room became the catalyst that turned this whole area of Mount Zion into really a very wealthy and important Christian headquarters since the time of the apostles down through the Byzantine period and even afterwards. This is depicted on the map of the famous map of Madaba, a sixth century floor mosaic in the church of St. George in Madaba in Jordan. Um, and on this map, you can see here is a, a drawing of Jerusalem on the, of the map. And here circled here, right here is Mount Zion, Mount Zion the church of Mount Zion. Um, here is the Holy Sepulcher. Um, here is Stephen's Gate and the Damascus Gate and the Long Corridor here, the main road in Jerusalem, and then Bethlehem over here. Here's just a reconstruction um, of, uh, of, or sort of a mapping of what we saw earlier here um, in the map of Madaba, and here is where the Aya Zion would have been, was located on that map, perhaps marking the place um, of the uh, Last Supper. And again, this is the area that we've been talking about down here in the southwest corner of Jerusalem. Father Eugene, Last Supper and Farewell Discourse. Thank you so much, Eugene. So if I can share now the screen with you. My friends, again, 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 thank you for your patience with us. We try to do the best here to go through all these sessions. And by the way, I was looking today, I was checking today if there is something similar to our webinar done by Orthodox people, nothing similar. We're gonna struggle now after these sessions and after the um, Pascha uh, to put together probably uh, these episodes or just something similar because we have a lot of stuff here and we like to share with other people on YouTube. So the Last Supper in Jesus' farewell discourse. So what happened actually? When we go to church Thursday evening and we have the priest reading the 12 Gospels, those 12 Gospels are long passages narrating what happened in that upper room for a number of hours, I would say probably around 5 p.m., up to midnight, 11, something like this, over so six hours. So that was the time they were having that last supper. By the way, John tells us that that was an ordinary supper, was not a Passover supper. The lamb is missing. Uh, from the table of the disciples and Jesus. So that was a regular supper. That's why we have the Eucharist in the Orthodox Church done with leavened bread. It was a regular bread, it was not the azima, like the synoptics will suggest. So probably John is right. I was talking when I was a student back in my years at Ecole Biblique with one of the greatest scholars in the New Testament area, 
Professor Jerome Murphy O'Connor, and he was telling me that you guys, he's a Dominican, he was a Dominican Catholic priest and professor there, and said, said to me, you guys, the Orthodox, you have it right. Because actually John is right. That was a common uh, supper. Jesus knew that he will not be alive for the Passover supper. And he wanted to have a similar supper with his apostles. What a touching, actually, element we have here. But this was not a Passover supper. It was a regular supper. So what Jesus did at this supper is called the farewell discourse, because this will be the last supper. Jesus told the apostles that uh, he will never drink again from the fruit of the vine with his disciples until the fruit of vine or the vine itself would be renewed in his father's kingdom. He was referring to the end of time. So till the end of time, we do in his memory, the Eucharistic service where under the prayers of the Argos, Arax, where priests, the gifts, the bread and wine are turned into the blood and the body of Christ. So again, this is uh, the upper room. Uh, and what happened to the last stop in Jesus' farewell discourse? A few things that I'll go very quickly. Again, I'm sorry, uh, because the time is on. Uh, the first thing was the washing of the feet in love commandment. Then the institution of the Eucharist. Then the promise of the Holy Spirit. Then the middle state of the soul, what happened to us when we're going to go from this life. So these are important moments and uh, that farewell discourse of Jesus at the Last Supper. Mystical Supper here, the washing of feet. So what is the message of this washing of feet? We know that Jesus uh, took a towel and washed the feet of his disciples and then gave us a message. This is imitatio Christi, to do the same, to be kind and ready to minister, to serve to one another, but not only one holy Thursday, like we see priests or bishops washing even the Pope, washing the feet of some worshipers. But this is the liturgical enactment of the foot washing. It's nice, beautiful, symbolic, but it's not the lesson that we have to learn. The lesson that we have to learn Wherever you are, the potus, the pope, the biggest boss, you should be every day a servant to your brothers and sisters if you like to be a Christian. So this is the, what we learn from the washing of the feet. We know that in the Old Testament, the washing of the feet was a sign of hospitality and serving attitude. Genesis chapter 18, 4, Abraham offers himself to wash the feet of three heavenly guests. Washing the feet, the feet uh, the first act of entering a tent or house in ancient Orientals, you sandals. So washing the feet was both cleansing, if you like, and refreshing, washing done by guests themselves, like we see in Genesis 18, uh, a basin of water was uh, offered to, to, to the guest. Jesus washing the apostles' feet meant that they were cleansed and refreshed for a new life initiated by the crucified and risen Lord. Keep in mind, my good friends, with the good Friday on our Lord Jesus Christ offered himself on the cross of Golgotha. Then Saturday, when he, Jesus, in his spirit, went to Hades and liberated Adam and Eve and the righteous people and brought them to the heavenly paradise. And then more importantly, on Sunday of resurrection, we are living in a world which is falling apart, but we are still an eschaton. So Jesus washed the apostles' feet as a sign that they were cleansed and refreshed for a new life initiated by the crucified and risen Lord, a new life which can start tomorrow if God decides that that will be the parousia day. So the same with us.
When we approach the Holy Communion with a pentive heart, when we do the sacrament of confession and we confess our sins, we, we are refreshed and cleansed, and then we take the body, the blood of Christ, so we are like exactly in the position of the disciples of the Holy Thursday when Jesus cleansed their feet, cleansed and refreshed for the new life, which can start anytime. The institution of Eucharist was the second important moment. Don't insist on this because everyone now participating to the liturgies and the Orthodox tradition knows what the Eucharist is. Eucharist is a word in Greek, which means thanksgiving. So we go to church Sunday by Sunday and always when there is a liturgy to bring what? to bring a thanksgiving to God for all the gifts he put on us on the previous weekend. Let's say that you got Sunday, then you have to thank God for all the gifts that he gave you. And then you receive a gift from God, which is his son who accepted, katadechone, accepted willingly and thoughtfully the cross, all the passion, and then he offered himself to us. So he's like exchanging gifts, my good friends. But this is the, uh, the, the Eucharist. Like I said, what is the meaning of Eucharist? Humbleness. Jesus chose the basic stuff, bread and wine, to make his presence among us real and efficient. Yesterday I was talking about God's presence in ancient Israel through the temple. But you see, Jesus accepted something very basic, bread and wine, and said, just take this bread and wine and read the prayers of bishops, like I said, or priests. These elements are transformed, turned into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the humble attitude of Jesus, choosing this basic stuff. He showed us also through Eucharist, through the institution of Eucharist, the love that he has for us. He gave himself on our behalf and for our salvation. And he didn't ask us anything to do. So when we do something good, imagine that you are like writing a thanksgiving card to God. When you go to church, my good friends, you don't add anything. Everything was paid for you. Everything was done for you and for me. But what we can do now is like sending a card and saying to God and his son, thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Another important meaning of the institution of Eucharist is longing for our companionship. Jesus wants us in his companionship with us. That's why wine, bread, even a table, when we offer to others, is not just to have some food for, to fill our stomachs. It's actually to have parea, to have the companionship with others. So Jesus offered these elements to us. He's saying like this, guys, I longed for companionship with you. Another important element at the Last Supper was the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus promised to us the Holy Spirit. What do we know about the Holy Spirit? We know that actually is keeping the primordial state of matter within God's plan. We read this in Genesis 1-2 when God began to create the world that we see right now, he sent the Holy Spirit up in the Tohu Vavohu, up in a chaotic state of matter. So to keep that matter under his control, when he will start to create the light and all other things and that six day creation. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? It's bridging humanity with its creator. Genesis 2, 7. This is very important, my friends. We are very similar to the animals. If you look in Genesis chapter 2, we are created from the ground. God modeled the animals or shaped the animals. God shaped the human being. But what differentiates the human being from the animals is that God breathed his breathing of life upon us. That breathing of life coming 
upon us in the day of Adam's creation was the role of the Holy Spirit to link us to God. You see, the animals are not linked to God. We are the unique species in the entire visible and invisible universe, which are linked to God through the Holy Spirit. And there is no way to separate us from God because of this participation of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Spirit, Holy Spirit is to intercede for us because we are weak and we need somebody to intercede for us. The Holy Spirit and humanity, we see these fragments in Genesis chapter 6, God was so mad that some divine beings were now having union with women, and from that union, some bastards, I call these bastards because they are bastards, hybrids, were born, and those hybrids were called Nephilim, and God was so angry. With that corruption, with that kind of combination between humans and divine creatures that he wanted to destroy the world. And he was almost to destroy the world, but he found the family, family of Noah. And then we have the flood of the Luge and that family was escaped, was, uh, was, was surviving. Then we learn from Joy. So that time in Genesis chapter six, we learned that God withdrew the Holy Spirit from humanity. So we we're left alone, almost like the animals. We got to, because God took away the spirit from us and just, 300 years before the coming of Christ by prophet Joel, God promises that he will send again the Holy Spirit. And it happened. We see this in John chapter 20. Jesus now, the resurrected Lord, appears to his holy disciples. There were 10 there in the same upper room. He appeared to them and he breathed upon the disciples. The Holy Spirit and said, Please receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, we learn the descent of the Holy Spirit happened upon the apostles on the 50th day on the Pentecost Sunday. And that another, another part of history starts. And we learn about the Holy Spirit in Revelation 22, the last chapter of the book of Revelation, the last book of scripture, we learn that the Holy Spirit will announce the seven, the second coming or the parousia of our Lord. So this is a quite important text regarding the role of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives is in Romans. Uh, St. Paul says here, the spirit helps, this is the translation, but the word is sin until I'm vanity. Sin until I'm means to take together so the Holy Spirit is taking together the cross of our responsibilities, and when we cannot carry this cross together with the Holy Spirit, he will take it instead of us, anti. This is a superb example what ancient Greek can offer in terms of theology. Sin anti Lambano, the translation helps, is just a poor translation. The Holy Spirit is like taking the cross with us, and sometimes we stumble, we fall down, then the Holy Spirit takes the cross by himself in place of us, and he's doing this sharing in our weaknesses. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in our relationship with God is interceding with God, and then helping us, like I said, this beautiful word, sin anti Lampano, to take along with and instead of us. The middle state of the soul this is the not another important theme which Jesus touched at the, uh, at the Last Supper. What do we know? We know from Genesis 2 7 that the man, the humanity was created or fashioned rather from dust. The heavens belongs to the angels, the earth belongs to the animals. But what is humans' destination? We have an interesting text in Hebrews chapter 13, 14, where Paul says, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. So we don't have, we are like fluctuating, my friends. We are oscillating between heavens, the boat of angels, and earth, the boat of animals. But humans don't have, like St. Paul says, an enduring city here. 
We are created by God to live eternally in the city where kingdom of God, which is the new earth, the new heaven promised by God in Isaiah chapter 65, and also recorded in Revelation, which will become the reality at the end of time. But till then, what is our destiny? What will be the middle state or the intermediary stage when the soul departs the body for each of us. During the Old Testament period, human souls, good or bad, were going to the same place. The forgotten and visited by God place was not a place of damnation, but kind of forgotten place by God called in Hebrew Sheol, meaning unknown, a cold, muddy, watery place situated on the world. Jesus revealed to his disciples and to us a great truth regarding the state of the soul when departs this life. He says like this at the Last Supper, my father's house, Ikea, has many waiting rooms. You know, there are different translations here. We have mansions, rooms, but in Greek we have an interesting word, mone, which comes from meno, which in ancient Greeks means to linger, to wait for some period of time. So these are called waiting rooms. So my father's house, many waiting rooms. If they are not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus speaks of God's house having many waiting groups. The Greek word waiting rooms, like I said, comes from men to linger. So this word hints at the temporary intermediary character of the heavenly dwelling place. So through Jesus, we say that Jesus actually opened the gates of the heavenly paradise. That is called my father's house. And he prepared, he adjusted this heavenly abode for us, for a temporary intermediary dwelling place until the end of time when soul and body will be reunited in a totally transformed, renewed human being to live eternally in God's kingdom. So heaven is the place for the middle state of the soul, is not forever. It is not our final destination, which will be rather a transformed world called in the Bible, new heaven and new, new earth. Notably, the text refers also to Jesus' work of preparing a place for us in God's house, because this God's house was destined only for angels, these spiritual beings, it was not destined for us. So Jesus tells us this great news, I go to my father. I know that in my father's house there are many waiting places, but I need to make some adjustments for you because you are not like angels. Your soul, if you like, is a physical soul because cohabitates with your body. So I have to make some adjustments for you guys. 